what matters to Beijing, what matters to the CCP and G personally, is power preservation. And economic growth is no longer part of that conversation. It's about the politics. It's about the security lockdown. It's about setting the narrative. And to a degree, does that make China more dangerous? Certainly. But it also means that no matter what they do, China as an internationally diverse, economically wired country is not long for this world. So uh, back to China for a second. Uh, sure. That I, I saw a terrific headline uh, in an FP article recently that said, China can make friends or break legs. It can't do both. It was referring, <laughs> that's a good headline, right? Kudos. Yeah. It, it was referring to some of the lending associated with the Belt and Road Initiative, some of the countries they lend to, or you know, now for infrastructure problems, projects rather, um, having trouble paying it back. And they, you know, how, how do they behave? But, but actually, if you take that headline, I think it can be applied on a broader sense as well. Does it make sense for China to adopt an aggressive posture given some of the economic challenges it faces domestically? they're in a position where there's no real clear path forward. So I don't want to say one particular path is the one that will or won't work because none of them really will. The headline in specific, uh, the idea is that China did Belt and Road. And during COVID, they went and told everybody that these were all loans. And everyone's like, no, no, these were all totally grants. And the only country that tried to pay them back was Sri Lanka. And we know how that went. Uh, the Africans literally lapped the Chinese delegations out of the room when the Chinese asked to be paid back. So, you know, that's that was a trillion dollars wasted. Um, the way I would phrase it isn't so much break legs. Like people are only if you pay people to be your friends, they're only your friends as long as you pay them. Mm. Uh, taking a harsher stance with these countries is just sure to tank relations. I would say that the warrior wolf diplomacy has done a great job of that already. But there's no country or series of countries that the Chinese can threaten to get what they want. There's also no country or series of countries that they can invade and conquer to get them what they need. They need a bottomless supply of foreign technology and a bottomless supply of foreign consumption. And politically, that was always questionable, but now technically it's no longer even possible. The only country that might, might, might be able to help them out is the United States, but that means doing everything the United States' way. And I would even argue that with demographic decline around the world, even if China were to roll over and show the United States its belly, I'm not sure the United States any longer has the capacity to provide the scale of assistance that would help a system that has become as stilted and broken as the Chinese system is internally. I mean, this is a country where Enron-style investment has existed over an order of magnitude higher than it did in the United States where every economic sector is teeter on and the, the brink of financial dissolution by the way we understand financial rules. It's the world's most dependent country in terms of imports and exports. It's completely dependent on energy imports and raw material exports. And at the end of the day, it has to sell to the American consumer. It's like, I'm not sure we could help if we wanted to. So what matters to Beijing, what matters to the CCP and G personally, is power preservation. And economic growth is no longer part of that conversation. It's about the politics. It's about the security lockdown. It's about setting the narrative. And to a degree, does that make China more dangerous? Certainly. But it also means that no matter what they do, China as an internationally diverse, economically wired country is not long for this world. And that means it's all going to be different for everyone in the not too distant future. Yeah, and there's there are always people who just find that statement uh, hard to believe, you know, given the sort of size and power to date of China and that it's centrally controlled. Do you do you think a military invasion, based on what you just said, of Taiwan is is a real threat, or is that a distraction? I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I, I, I'm kind of a, the minority in my world that I really think that the chances of a, a Taiwan war are low. The, the, the way that the Chinese look at this is they've always considered the Russians to be a useful idiot. And if they're thinking of doing something that's going to stir the pot, they kind of nudge the Russians to try it first to see how it goes. And the Taiwan war would fall into that category. So they saw the Ukraine war as a useful proxy. And it hasn't gone the way that they thought. So, you know, number one, they thought the war would be physically easy because, you know, you can walk to Kiev and the Ukrainians have only been preparing for eight years. Well, you got to swim to Taipei. And the Taiwanese have been preparing for 45. And so when the war in Ukraine got bogged down, like, ah, crap, assumption one, gone. 
Uh, assumption number two, they thought the Russian w weapons were great, so they cloned them. They stole the IP just like they have for everybody else and cloned $3 trillion worth of them. And they're now having some very, very serious buyer's remorse, although I guess it would be theft remorse. Uh, so, you know, assumption two gone. Assumption three is that everyone will just get over it. Well, we now have the most robust sanctions regime in history on the Russians. And it would be a lot worse for China because Russia is a massive exporter of food and energy. China is the world's biggest importer of both. But I think what has really terrified the Politburo are the boycotts. Because here you have private citizens and companies who, without prodding from their governments, have just walked away from you know, $500 billion of sunk costs. There is no Chinese economic system without international trade, foreign technology, and market access. And the idea that Halliburton has left Russia on moral grounds. You know, there is no moral cover for anyone who wanted to stay in Russia. And the Chinese look at their system like, you know, they were doing a genocide long before the Russians started. You know, this is a country that isn't a democracy. This is a country that cracks down on protesters. This is a country with a horrible record of social management. There's a lot more places for Western ideology to kind of get the claws into if you really want to take it down. And they now know that the West is perfectly capable of doing it. The financial sanctions against Russia prompted a lot of conversation about the weaponization of the dollar. Sure. Would, would it prompt the Chinese to look to increase trade in yuan, especially when you're talking about oil, petro yuan, for example? Do you think that there is any possibility of that? Would Middle East producers entertain the idea of pricing oil in yuan? Could they find traction with that? I don't think there'd be a lot. Uh, one of the things we saw with the Russians and when they tried to move away from the dollar and the euro, uh, they went into whatever currency was available. And honestly, there weren't a lot left at that point. But they did put about a quarter of a trillion dollars, if memory serves, into the yuan. And then when they tried to cash it in later, the Chinese were like, nope, we don't want that back. And so <laughs> the Russians have been forced to move back into the euro and the dollar, just do it really quietly because there just aren't, aren't a lot of options. And then, of course, they fly around a lot of gold. That's really their most reliable way of getting around sanctions. So there's not a lot of options. Uh, in the case of the Persian Gulf, there might there might be some room there because the Saudis in particular, now that the United States is no longer their largest consumer and no longer their security guarantor, they've been looking for a new friend. The Chinese have come in with a lot of money and a lot of demand. And so the Saudis have done kind of a co-investment thing in industrial plant in China and refineries, just like they did in the United States. And having a yuan trade for that specific sales line, that makes a degree of sense. But keep in mind that if there is a conflict that involves China and the United States, no ships will be coming and going from China. So the Saudis know full well that if you are involved in a hot war with the United States, your tankers don't go there. And so there would be no point in a hot war scenario for the Saudis to do that. Yeah, in a hot war scenario, we are talking about the deindustrialization of the Chinese system and famine within a year. Because this is a country that imports 75% of its energy and 75% of the inputs that allow it to grow its own food. Uh, if, 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 I don't think there will be, if mm. we do have a conflict over Taiwan that does involve either Japan, the United States, Vietnam, or India, because any one of them can do this. That is the end of China as a modern industrialized power with over a billion people. We all know that there are some massive issues with the world economy today. From falling real wages, inflation, the rise of technology. Is AI going to take our jobs? Robotics, massive debt, geopolitical issues, deglobalization. Macro affects everything. And we're going to give you not only what the big problems are out there, we're going to show you the solutions. Demographic experts, we're going to have Peter Zihan talk about geopolitics, Dario Perkins talking at the big picture macro views. We will get a whole big view from Dwight Anderson, one of the greatest commodity investors in the world. And we're going to get my very good friend Emad Mostak back to talk about AI. Because that's what investing really is. It's a way of creating your future self. Go to realvision.com forward slash future and you'll see why Real Vision is so useful for you in your Web3 journey and your journey through life.
we're, we're discussing, you know, in that region and the, the, you know, China needing that global trade, India has really set itself up as the alternative, as everyone's looking to to make sure they reduce their dependence. We're going to be touching on India as, as part of a, a series and talking about the digital transformation because they have managed in a way at scale to start pulling people into their formal economy um, through their digital ID system that they've put in place. Is India in any way set up or able to help in this situation where we're, I don't mean help, but contribute or fill a gap of this declining China supply chains that are now reshoring but are going to be broken for a while? What? How does India fit into this picture? Uh, the answer is yes and no. So I am broadly bullish on India. It's set apart from most of the world's problems. It's the first stop on the, the, the shipment route from Persian Gulf to uh, the oil markets of Asia. It's never going to have an energy crisis. Uh, and it's security issues with Pakistan and Bangladesh, not that they're minor, but they're, they're kind of ossified. And they only are going to boil up into a hot war if something goes really, really wrong in multiple places. So I don't think it's very likely. So the problems of India aren't going to go away. So the digitalization, for example, that you brought up, that can happen, but never for the whole population. But that's okay. Uh, if only a third of the economy, if only a third of the population get brought into the modern age, that's still more people than the European Union. And you can have a growth story. And just like the United States and NAFTA, we're going to have to build a lot of industrial plants to replace what we're going to lose from Germany and China. So will India. So that's a growth story, too. But India will never have partners. The countries on its borders are either too poor or too hostile. They will never be integration targets. And everyone else is too far away. And the, Indi the Indians have never been in favor of free trade. So any manufacturing and industrial build out in India is going to be for the Indians, just like most of the build out in North America is going to be for the most of the North Americans. That will limit the quality level, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be successful. So India is India doing things for India on based on its own logic, and that is a very good story. But if you think that they're about to become a major global power, no, they never have been because they've been too isolated. So you can have a very strong success story and still be it not part of a global story. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.